Hi, everybody. I'm Alan Fletcher. I'm president of the Aspen Music Festival and School, and welcome to this flute studio class. These classes are actually my favorite thing of what we're doing in this virtual season. I love everything we're doing. Uh, but I think a window into the core activity in Aspen, which is the relationship of teachers and extraordinary students who are on the verge of major careers themselves, uh, is the essence. And we love that we're able to open a window onto the process of what happens in the studio uh, uh, for all of you. So uh, today uh, we have Damari McGill, a member of our faculty. I'll say a little bit more about him in a moment. But we have two wonderful people who would have been students with us this summer. Evan Pangras Salt uh, has multiple degrees from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. He is now the principal flute of the Pacific Northwest Ballet Orchestra and is also a substitute a player in the Auburn Symphony Orchestra and the Seattle Symphony. He was the 2016 prize winner in the Seattle Flute Society's Young Artists Competition. So we welcome Evan. Uh, Koi Din uh, graduated from Los Angeles County High School uh, for the Arts, is now an undergrad at UCLA, is a substitute for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, was a finalist in From the Top, a major radio show that we all love, uh, was a finalist there in 2018, and for two years has been a National Young Arts Foundation winner of honorable mention. So we're delighted that Evan and Koi are performing with us today. Damari McGill, I uh, was a student at Curtis and the Juilliard School, uh, winner of the Avery Fisher Career Grant, winner of the Sphinx Medal of Excellence, now a faculty member at Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, and uh, was principal in four major orchestras before his current position as principal flute in the Seattle Symphony. And uh, most important to us, Damari has joined our full-time faculty and we are thrilled to have him as a colleague. So I will now turn the class over to Damari. It's wonderful to be here with, with all of you. Um, I'm sad that I'm not seeing you in, um, in beautiful Aspen, but nevertheless, nevertheless, thanks to technology, we can still spend some, some quality time together, um, playing and working on uh, pieces from the flute repertoire. So let's, let's begin. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Evan, have you had the opportunity to play this in orchestra in context? Uh, many years ago, back in high school. I don't know if it counts though. Okay, but I'm sure you've listened to it numerous times. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, one of the most important things about, about this excerpt is that there's so much has happened prior to this particular moment. So much has happened. We've had um, uh, more than three movements worth of, of music. And in particular, with the last, the, the last movement specifically, um, there's this buildup. Everything that's, that, has that has happened prior to this in the last movement is leading up to this solo. So when I play this, I like to put that weight on my shoulders, that everything that has happened up until this point is leading up into this wonderful, um, joyful, heroic moment. And right now, the way you play this, it's, it's, it's really, it's very good. It's very good. But in particular, for the eighth notes, whenever you have an eighth note, you know, then followed by the 16th notes, 
it doesn't sound to me like you are accepting this responsibility, this weight of everything leading up to this moment. Um, they sound a little, a little too placid, a little too easy going for my taste. And I want you to give every single eighth note, everything that you have you know, so that it is an appropriate arrival after everything that we've heard prior to this. Let's start right, right on the solo. And um, a great place to start, of course, is the very first note. I would love to hear uh, the most brilliant D you can, you're, you're, you can play. Just, let's just play the first note, the first D. Yes, what I, that's wonderful. What I really would love to hear is that at the end of this D, that this D cannot wait to get to that first 16th note, even if we're isolating it. Okay. Again. Okay, this is great. When we, I want to play it from the solo. And at the end of the D, once again, have this energy that's leading us into the C, okay? Let's try this. Okay, great, I like this a lot. The same energy that you had in that first D, I would love to hear when you get to that first E, eighth note. I would love to hear that, and as you descend, I want you to maintain that singing quality so that the line is very obvious. And it's, if, as soon as you do this, then you have my attention. I am officially following what you're doing. You understand? Okay, let's start from the D again. Oh, good, good, good. Good, good. But continue with every long note. I want... We... Continue this singing quality. You have my attention, so don't, don't, um, don't release that, you know, that energy. Please continue it. One more time. This is really this is really opening up. When we go back to the repeat, I really appreciate the energy that you're bringing to that note now. I want to add another ingredient to this, another spice. And that is this really is a a feel good solo. You know, it feels good to play it. It's satisfying to play it in isolation, it's satisfying to play it within the ensemble, you know? Because of that, there is a gauge that I use to determine, to make sure that um, this is as spirited and as gorgeous as it can possibly be. And that is the ability that I, that I like to really exploit, the ability of my, for, my, for my playing to give me chills, to give me goosebumps, you know? So it, it may sound silly, but can you imagine then when you're playing and when you go back to that repeat and you get back to this D, that your playing is so, so spirited, so beautiful, that when you return to this B, that whew, did you give yourself chills. It's a wonderful gauge. Um, let's go for that as a goal. It's something that I believe that your intent to create that kind of reaction with, within yourself is enough for me to have a reaction. Okay, one more time, the first time through, and we'll repeat. Okay, 
good. Good, and we get to this chromaticism. You know, this is the easiest and maybe the ultimate way of, 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 of putting expression into music. When we get to this D, I would love for you to uh, make very clear why this is different than the opening of the solo. It's different. If we're dealing in, in colors, if I happen to be a visual person, and if, if you aren't, pretend like you are and just go with me right now, okay? When we get to this, if we're dealing with like a, um, at the opening of the solo, like a blood orange, you know, very, you know, rich orange or something, then this D right here, um, for the second half of the solo, let's go for red. You know, I want, so whatever you injected into that first note of the solo, I want even, I want even more of that. And I would love for you to sustain that as we descend so that there is um, um, an even bolder representation of this feeling than there was initially. Okay, uh, the beginning of the solo, second time through. Okay, great. This is wonderful. Wonderful. When we get to the this D sharp, I'm not feeling I'm not feeling the life, the energy inside of this note at all. I want even more. This is the, the first time we're introduced to this. D has been our friend throughout this. And we go a step up, you know, to its more controversial cousin. I need to really feel that. Okay, um, in the interest of time, because I want to get to uh, the second excerpt, let's start at the beginning of the ex at the excerpt at the 2D. My general comment about the 2D is that the 2D cannot wait to get to the solo. This is definitely not a casual layback moment, of course, right? But remember everything that has happened prior to this in this movement that is leading us to this moment. So from a, uh, on a scale from zero to 10, 10 being uh, the most energetic you can be, the most enthusiastic and optimistic you can be, uh, let's, let's say that you were a four, <laughs> okay? Um, I would be happy with a seven or eight, energy-wise. It's, gonna, it's about to happen. And by the way, the note before the solo, which some people do cheat when they're playing this in orchestra and they let the, the section play it, it needs, to, it needs to be complete, full of energy, although you have a solo to play. Don't play it like you may play it when you're playing in an orchestra. It needs, it needs to be brilliant. From after that first note, can we can we have a little bit more of a line until you get to the duple? And the duple, obviously, is weighted. Okay. 
Good, good. Can we attach, once we get this, the rest is actually easy. Can we attach some um, a, a emotional context to the duple? It's after this, um, like rhythmic optimism. But it can't be this kind of reaction. Okay, let's try that. Let's just continue. Okay, Evan. Okay, let's just just to wrap wrap up. The one one thing that the two things I want you to consider, and I definitely heard it in the first duple, okay? That, that was great. I would love to hear even more of that, of course, in the next set. For the remainder of the excerpt, whenever you have a duple, I want that to be like an emotional motif, okay? Whenever you have a trill, I, I want it to be an expressive gesture as opposed to a, a, a technical machine gun kind of thing, okay? If you do that, I think this will really up, uplift, upgrade this, ex, this excerpt. You sound, you sound great. I mean, just the sound is, is really terrific. Um, just inject everything, everything you do with life. And that will be the thing that more people, I think I, for me, for sure, would be able, that's the thing that I will latch on to when I hear you play. And that's the thing that a lot of your colleagues won't be doing because they're simply trying to get it right.
Okay, okay, Koi. Let's, let's, work, let's work on this. This sounds really beautiful. Very gorgeous sound. The most important thing for me in, in all, all music, all music, is, is pulse. Okay? It's pulse or it's, when it's appropriate, the absence of it. And the reason why this is the case, at least in my mind, is because if we have, you know, this, this kind of, this kind of rhythm, there's music already in that, in that I would love for you to focus more on pulse, on subdivision. I really do believe that it is the literal heartbeat of, of what we do. And without the heartbeat, then everything, everything else we're, we're doing is at least demand to life. Okay, from the top. Okay, this is great. When you go up to the E, really feel the pulse here. Allow the subdivision to give the music energy, okay? And when you get to anything articulated in this music, once again, in, embrace the subdivision. Okay, one more time from the top. Even more so, let's uh, embrace the subdivision. Good, good. Let's just start right before this section. And make sure when you take a breath that you are concerned that you may be a little late. Okay, so just be concerned about that and it's gonna be perfect. All right, just a little bit before this. Okay, can you actually try to maintain the tempo just a little bit longer? You know, just, just a little bit longer because it will, and try to do what you are doing with the tempo, mainly with the, with the sound. So you're gonna change any kind of, any kind of relaxing till the, maybe the very end, the very, very end, okay? Let's try that. Yes, you don't you don't actually need much of anything here. By the time you get to That takes care of, as I, I use, the, I use the, the imagery of like the music not having any bones for the beginning of the piece. Right here, you can, without slowing down so much, remove the bones from the music and it will sound placid and it will sound mysterious enough. You know, instead of digga, 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 without slowing down. This, um, start from the same place again. And then we'll continue.
Nice. Okay. Okay, this is great. Can we play from here? And I personally feel that anything that's articulated needs to be just a little bit more spirited. Um, sometimes, and it, it, this is not the case all the time, but oftentimes when we have this a back and forth between something slurred and something articulated, we tend to play like the articulated notes with the same energy that we're playing the slurred note. We play them beautifully, beautifully. This, you know, and I would love to hear that difference, that contrast between what's slurred and what isn't, you know? And it's possible that you could start this, this musical gesture that way and end it with both of these ideas being kind of the same. But initially, I need a, a little bit more diction, you know, clarity on articulated notes. Let's put this all together. Let's start, let's start from the top. Once we get this, the rest of the piece is fine. But really focusing on creating as much sort of emotional distance between the two ideas. I promise you, the more energy the articulated notes have, then the more I will appreciate the beauty of the more melodic and slurred passages. Okay? Also, make sure that you're really um, not taking extra time when you breathe. Okay? Okay, from the top, pulse. Good. Energy? Okay, I think, I, think this is, I think this is great. Really wonderful playing, both of you. This, this type of thing, I'm sure all of you guys have encountered, this kind of, this, in the indication, the printed indication paired with what um, would be intuitive or not even intuitive, uh, what seems to be musically necessary, like the piano marking in Dvorak's eight solo, for instance. Um, and so you mentioned when you played this last semester, you, you crescendo to, to pass it on, right? I would say that that musical, that instinct to do when you're playing it in an audition setting is really important because anyone who's played this before, even if you're not a flutist, 
is is used to that 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 um, intent to pass it on. There's a way that you can do that and still legally do what the composer wrote when you're playing this by yourself. There is a way to balance the intent um, or to justify it based on your the experience you have from playing this in reality um, and pairing that with what's actually written. For instance, for instance, also to use the Divorce Act 8 as an example, the reason why I justify actually not playing this solo softly, well, first of all, is because I played it a million times in orchestra. And if I actually really played this with the piano character, it would sound ridiculous. I would sound like I didn't know what I was doing. But I believe that I can create I can create um, something that doesn't feel that doesn't scream forte by making sure that my articulation is rounded out. As soon as I that first DNA divorce act, for instance, if ta, if it's too aggressive, then immediately the person looking at the score will see that is not that's so wrong. You know, if I keep it rounded and singing, they won't even pay attention to that piano. In this case, if you have the intention to pass it on, if you're hearing the strings afterwards, for instance, I believe, in the, in the Mahler, if you're hearing that and you play it in a similar fashion to you as you would play it in context, but not exaggerating the crescendo, because the point is not a crescendo. The point is a handing off of the music. So if you actually focus on what your intent is and not on, I made a crescendo when I played this in orchestra, then I will feel that intent and I won't be disturbed by the fact that it happens to be a little louder. You understand? I mean, it's just a diff it's a difference in how you approach on how you approach what you're trying to do. You're not, you shouldn't try to crescendo. You should try to be a good chamber musician at the end. It's very simple. I, I'm always grateful, <laughs> period. You know, I don't take anything that I'm able to do for granted because there was a time when it was my dream to do those things. That said, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. Um, so learning how to be efficient is really, is really important. Learning how to actually learn from these different aspects of your musical life is really important. Learning how to actually apply the things that you're learning from one part of your musical life to the other parts. Um, is very, very important. For instance, when if I'm like when I'm in Cincinnati, after I'm done, like my first day of teaching in Cincinnati, I'm usually pretty tired because I lose a night of sleep because I'm always take a red eye after the concert from Seattle. And the flight is actually not terribly long, um, but I lose those hours. So but after I know that I have to find some time to practice. You know, so the one thing that I do is that I've been for hours that day instructing people on how to best play this music, how to best work in this music. If I only apply what I'm preaching to what I'm doing in like maybe like 45 minute practice session, then I'm usually in good shape to at least uh, be closer to this music that I'm trying to learn than if I had maybe three hours and was practicing like I had all of the time in the world. So just learning to be efficient, um, being grateful for anything and everything that comes your way that is making you tired, but you wouldn't give it up for the world. Motivation is, is tricky. So 
I'll offer you two bits of things that I, that I focus on. The first thing is balance. And it's this idea of, of, of recognizing that it's important to know when to sit on the couch and when to get off the couch. Both are extremely important and have been extremely important in my life over the past four months or so. Um, there are times when um, I could be just tired for no reason. Maybe it's just I'm not used to being in front of a computer all day long, for instance, you know? And I allow myself, okay, that's enough. Get on the couch, right? But what's equally, if not more important than that, is knowing when that's enough and it's time to pick up the instrument again. I am not searching for some divine intervention. I'm not searching for some mystical motivation, you know? I just know that there is a time when I need to get up and I need to take out my instrument and I need... I need to play because consistency and discipline can nurture and inspire beauty. Performance anxiety. Boy, yes, that's, this is real. Um, it's something that is definitely a part of my life. Um, so much so that it doesn't make any sense to fight it, you know? So what I try to do is that I try to raise my level of playing, assuming or preparing for a situation where that level is going to drop because of my nerves. But when it drops, the playing is still effective moving and good enough so that you have no idea. You understand? So I guess we can, we can attribute that to preparation, to doing things like, I never, for instance, ever try to peak. You know, I never try to hope to play better than I've ever played in my life, ever. I am trying, I am working so that my worst playing is still ins inspiring. Because I've practiced, I'll give you an example. I've, when I'm, if I'm working on a concerto or, or a sonata or an excerpt, the way I'm practicing is that I am trying, I am practicing to make this really beautiful. I know what I'm going, I know that I'm going to play vibrato in this note and maybe I would have lost time. So I'm going to move here. And, and while doing that, I would have actually created a beautiful phrase. You know, I, I know that on, that this note tends to be sharp. I know this note tends to be flat. I, this is what I have been practicing. So even when I am extremely nervous in a high stress situation, if I just simply do what I've been practicing, if I just do that, even while nervous, then it will still be beautiful because I've been practicing on how to make it beautiful as opposed to practicing on how to make it right. How do I prepare for auditions? One uh, imp very important part of that is, is I, even pr prior to my first job, I was able to have some sense as to when an opening would happen. Honestly, even just based on age, I can guess, okay, five to seven years, seven to 10 years, okay? That kind of thing. But it's important, I think, for us, for, definitely for me, to be as prepared as possible before the audition is announced, okay? This is definitely something that I, that I do is something happens once you actually read the official job posting. Something happens. Um, there is the possibility to stop growing at that moment because 
you're right from that moment, you're focused on preparing these excerpts, preparing these excerpts for this audition, as opposed to progressing, getting better, improving your sound, your, your, you know, your sense of pulse, your sense of phrasing, uh, and growing in general. Just because you learn an excerpt and can play the excerpt well, doesn't necessarily mean that you've improved in general. So what I try to do is that I, even if I have an idea that something is going to be open, I, in an ideal world, want to have all of the excerpts prepared before I read it, because there's a shift, you know? So I almost feel that the level that I am as soon as I read that post, okay, well, this is the level I'm going to be. I just assume that, okay? So we want to get that level as high as possible, first of all. Um, preparing, technically speaking, for an audition list, um, these are things that you've all heard before. Um, and I would recommend, I mean, I tend to do things to the extreme while trying to maintain the balance of knowing when to sit on the couch and when to get off the couch, of course. Uh, but it's really important to know how you sound. Very important. This is very difficult, though, to know how you sound. So I am a serial recorder. I record myself a lot. I want to know how I sound when I'm tired, when I'm stressed out, when I'm having a bad day, you know, sound wise, I want to know what it sounds like when I'm having a good day. Am I really sounding good when I think I'm sounding good? Um, it's really important to, to play for a lot of people. I don't care who I play for. I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to just play for flutists. I'm trying to play for anyone that will actually have the patience to listen to me and give me uh, feedback. I don't care if the person is a musician. That person will have an opinion if they, if they feel comfortable enough to give it, you know? I will play for anyone who will listen to me um, because this is the one thing that, going to Koi's question about anxiety, one thing that also really does help is that if you play for a lot of people, and this is a very important thing, if you play for a lot of people and you do not pair that performance with excuses, you know, excuses are really are there to telling someone that we didn't have breakfast and that we didn't have a lot of sleep and that we didn't get a chance to warm up. These are all things to make us feel better. And if you want to get comfortable with anxiety, be quiet and accept how you're sounding in that situation under these circumstances. Accept that. It's really hard. Um, visualizing uh, walking out on stage. It's very important, at least for me, it is. Um, if I can't, if I don't have access even via a line of what the hall or, looks like, I guess, then I will just simply, before playing for someone, I imagine myself walking out. I imagine myself not saying a word. I imagine myself seeing a screen. I imagine that, you know, until so that by the time I get to doing that in reality, I've done it so many times that once again, I just need to simply do what I practice. So first of all, recording something that, <laughs> that you find uh, is a proper representation of your level and also recording something that is that is still beautiful even though you you're unable to take certain liberties um, because even if you're not playing with a click track you're playing perhaps with something that is already you know that has been pre-recorded you know so there's limitations so consider this as a, a, consider it a challenge that can help you 
better these things that are difficult. For instance, like uh, if you're able to play in a way that you would consider beautiful, even when you're unable to stretch this note, when you think about it, you should be able to do that. You understand? So embracing these challenges as things that could actually help you grow. One thing that, that we all can do is to, to pay attention to how we're solving problems that we're encountering, you know? So, because ultimately that will be an important part of your teaching is just the ability to, to problem, to problem solve. Because your desire to figure out a way to help them, your enthusiasm when it comes to that already makes you a good teacher. Even if you don't have the answer immediately, I want to make you better and I want to figure out a way to do that with you makes you a good teacher. I'm so, I'm so grateful that we, that we had this time, but I absolutely promise you that all of you guys have a role to play in, in this world, this musical world that, that we, we love. So figure out what that is. And I look forward to, to crossing paths with you guys in the future and learning from you because whatever your gift is is definitely something that will be unique not only to your colleagues but also to me and i look forward to learning from that and from you <laughs>